we will not fail. Hey everybody, welcome to History by the Month, a recurring series that explores historic events across the wide range of human endeavor organized by the month they occurred in. This month, our first-person perspective investigates events in war and peace that happened in January, and we're going to start with the birth of a traitor. January 14, 1741, Benedict Arnold is born. Of course, he wasn't born as a traitor, but he is well known as just that, a traitor to the cause of American independence. But before becoming a turncoat, he was actually one of the Revolutionary Force's best generals, highly respected by George Washington. So why did a man born in America, Norwich, Connecticut, turn traitor to the cause of American independence? To find out, correspondent Brenda Madden sat down with historian Nathaniel Philbrick, whose investigation of primary sources led him to write Valiant Ambition, George Washington, Benedict Arnold, and the Fate of the American Revolution. In many ways, he and Benedict Arnold were very similar, but of course, in very crucial ways, they were very different. Right, and that was a surprise for me to realize that they had um, a real similarity. And I think there, there was a part of Washington that was even envious of Arnold. If he had been, if Washington had been 10 years younger uh, he, and not saddled with the crushing responsibility of command, he could have been out there fighting those battles like Benedict Arnold. And, uh, but he couldn't, and, and, but he needed people like Arnold, and there was no one with a record that could really match Arnold's. And so Washington was very appreciative of his abilities. He, he realized that he was controversial. Uh, Arnold was very passionate, and those passions contributed to his charismatic presence on the battlefield. But when he wasn't in the middle of a fight, it, it could get him in trouble with fellow officers, particularly with politicians, but that was part of the package when it came to Benedict Arnold. And as you say, where we saw Washington evolve into a more mature and capable leader, we saw Arnold almost spiral into something right. worse. He was thin-skinned, and, uh, you know, and he also had to deal with some pretty bad situations. Uh, you know, he is the hero of Valcour Island. Uh, that winter, he's quite rightly expecting a promotion to Major General. He's the highest ranking brigadier with the best record. But the Continental Congress, which is, is the ones that decide what Major Generals Washington will have, decides to institute a new policy where each state will have two Major Generals. And since Arnold's home state of Connecticut already has two, they chose in their wisdom to overlook Arnold for promotion and, and promote five generals passed him to Major General. And this, you know, this w angered him and it perplexed Washington who immediately wrote Arnold say, look, I don't know what's going on here, but trust me, I will do everything I can to support you in this. And, you know, but Arnold, this, became, this began to change Arnold. He was like, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm doing all of this and I'm getting no respect for my own government. Why am I doing this? Throughout this, he was actually sympathetic to Arnold too, even though he was running this war. He looks to Arnold and, and I think has, you know, this is someone I can relate to. Uh, yes, he's kind of a controversial hothead, but boy, is he's exactly what I need on the battlefield. And so I think because of that, uh, Washington had a little bit of a blind spot when it came to Arnold. That even though he was loyal to George Washington, he still was able to engineer this betrayal. There was a, more than a little narcissism in when it came to Arnold, and it really helped him on the battlefield. He could convince himself that, you know, be, I'm going to do this and everybody should follow me and we're going to achieve it, and it almost always worked out that way. And, but that quality helped him when it came to uh, the fact when, when he began to say, you know, hey, why am I doing this? Uh, our country is falling apart. The British have more respect for me than my own country. Uh, it's time the British came in, restored the liberties we had prior to the revolution. And, you know, by, by my changing sides, I'm not, I'm not betraying my country. I'm doing what's best for them. And so he could convince himself of this. He was hardwired to be a traitor. It turns out Benedict was also influenced by his young wife, Peggy Shippen, who liked the British, and knew Major John Andre, who just happened to be their spy chief. So they fall in love, and she says to Arnold, look, you know, look how you're being treated by your own people. You know, you know what are you doing here? And, and I don't think it's, there's any accident that within a month of their marriage, 
uh, she, uh, Arnold sends his first feelers to the British, to none other than Major John Andre, who is in, in British-occupied New York and is now the British spy chief. They go back and forth for a year before he fully commits, commits to this. But I, don't, I think without Peggy, um, I, I don't know if it would have happened uh, because she really clearly, it's, and it's clear from the correspondence, she, she really was there uh, stage managing uh, much of this. What was Washington's reaction when this all dawned on him, what had, what had come so close to transpiring? Yeah, it really is amazing at the end where it's cloak and dagger stuff. You cannot make it up. It is just, you know, there's a midnight meeting with it's Andre and, yeah. and, and then uh, why, Arnold's in his headquarters at a, a house right on the bank of the, of the Hudson, just below West Point, uh, when he gets a letter that Andre has been captured. And he knows, oh my gosh, this will be revealed. And Washington is due to show up any moment now. And so he runs up to Peggy, says, look, I got to get out of here. Uh, and he hops on his barge and is rowed down the river and eventually makes it to British occupied New York. Washington arrives and he's with Hamilton, Lafayette, Henry Knox, the three officers who, whom he's closest. And he gets this letter uh, that informs him that they've captured Major, General, Ma Major John Andre and they have evidence that Arnold is a spy has wanted to turn over West Point to the British. He, Washington turns to, to Lafayette, you know, just in his early 20s, French officer upon, who's become almost a surrogate son to him. And he says, whom can we trust now? And I think that pretty much says it all. It was, it just took the wind out of his sails. You know, the, the general whom he had supported so, so wholeheartedly throughout, the, over the course of the last four years, um, had, had turned traitor. Incredibly, Arnold was never captured. He actually served as a general for the British during the rest of the Revolution and lived rather ignominiously in both Britain and Canada after the war. George Washington, of course, became the first president of a new nation. You can learn more about George Washington, Benedict Arnold, and the American Revolution in our complete interview with Nathaniel Philbrick. And teachers, this might be a good time to remind you that all of our videos, including this one, come with quick ideas for suggested use in the classroom. You can find them in the description of each video. Let's turn our attention, shall we, from the 18th century to the 20th century as we look at three more events of war and peace. It's January 17, 1991, and under the leadership of General Norman Schwarzkopf, Operation Desert Shield becomes Operation Desert Storm as the air war campaign begins in response to Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. At 0300 hours Kuwaiti time, jet fighters take off and missile attacks begin. U.S. President George H.W. Bush announces the onset. Now, the 28 countries with forces in the Gulf area have exhausted all reasonable efforts to reach a peaceful resolution, have no choice but to drive Saddam from Kuwait by force. We will not fail. Air attacks are underway against military targets in Iraq. And two soldiers who were there when it happened take us to the battlefield. Now, it was about three weeks before the air war started is when I arrived in country. I was in the infantry. I was a, a ground fighter. That's what we did. We were, we're the first, you know, the first to fight, as they always say, the first ones in, the last ones to leave. We got there. They sent us out to our units. You know, and within just a matter of days, the air war started. The, the night that the air war started, we'd actually come off patrol. We were running patrols, and we got back into the hooches there, and uh, everybody. We could hear a lot of commotion. The sirens started going off and things like that. And I remember that night walking outside and you could see the, the planes and all the fireworks going off, you know, and that, that's when the actual war started. So I was only in country a few days and uh, everything kind of kicked off. In the personnel office, we still had to do accountability where all the troops were. If there were anything going on back at home, I had to do a Red Cross notices and type letters for the, the general, the commander, or whatever. So as a support person in personnel, we still train. You know, I was NBC qualified, nuclear, biological, chemical qualified, so we gave classes during the day. So there's a lot of things going on. We didn't just sit around. We still had to continue to train ourselves and get ready. So if there were anything that was going to happen, we had to always be ready. Once the air war started, we, we got rid of the tents, and I lived in a hole in the ground. We would uh, move at night dig skirmisher trenches and we'd stay down in those holes at night 
And uh, for about three months, I lived in a hole. Uh, showered every 30 days, whether I needed it or not. You know, that was uh, what we did. And when I say a shower, it was, they would bring a truck out with a big, what they call a water bowl on the back of it. And it would shoot a little stream of water out and you would strip off in your hole and you'd run out in the middle of the desert and they'd squirt you down with water and you'd come back in. You know, you'd, uh, living wise, same t-shirt for about three months. Uh, you got a new pair of socks about once a week, they come out and throw you new socks so your feet wouldn't be too bad. So it was, uh, you know, they drive by, throw food out in the holes for you. It was very hot, you know, I don't think you could imagine how hot because you was out in the middle of a desert. And every night, most of that seems like when everything was really happening. The scuds was flying over your head, you would see missiles just, just shoot back and forth. And I think as soon as they hit Mop 4, we had to put on our gas mask, a uh, complete mop suit with the gloves, the boots, and then you had to sleep all night like that. You know, just imagine breathing in a gas mask all night because you don't know what kind of nerve gas or whatever's in the air. So the conditions was not that great, but we had to do the best we could. The first night that the Scud missiles hit, you know, I, we still had the tents at the time, and I was in my sleeping bag, had the buttons and the zipper up, and sometime during my sleeping, the, the sleeping bag had rolled to the where the buttons were behind me. We hear the air raid siren go off. We we're gonna take incoming fire. And we had to get out. We had trenches built outside that we could go out and take cover in. Well, when I went to open my sleeping bag, I couldn't get out. All I got was cloth. And so I ended up, it looked like it was snowing by the time I got out of there because I had destroyed the sleeping bag. The, all the stuffing was flying through the air and everything. Everybody got a pretty good kick out of the fact that the, the new boot that had just got to the platoon had destroyed his sleeping bag about two weeks after he got there. You know, then it got where it was almost a nightly occurrence that you're taking that. And, you know, then once we got out into the holes and we start moving it closer to Kuwait, you know, we would take mortar fire almost on a daily basis. And it, uh, it it's strange because you get almost used to the sound of those coming in. It's never a, you're never comfortable. And you know, I don't want to make a mistake there, but it's, it becomes a part of your everyday life, it seems like. It was my privilege to interview those two soldiers. Master Sergeant Williams continued to serve after the war, and infantryman Dennis McCaws returned home to build a life with his family. 46 years earlier, on January 27, 1945, another major event in the history of war and peace in January occurred as Soviet forces liberated Auschwitz concentration camp. The excitement and joy of that liberation, of course, would be mixed with the tragic reality that would be revealed once we learned what had happened at Auschwitz. It was my honor to learn from Holocaust survivors George Brady and Rachel Miller as they shared their stories of Auschwitz. Nobody in his right mind who is normal can imagine what Auschwitz was, right? Because, you know, the sh it was a shock like you cannot imagine because we traveled in a cattle car for about a day and a half without food and just a bucket in the corner for a toilet and and so you are pretty tired. The luggage was with us. We were sitting on the luggage. And when we arrived in Auschwitz in the middle of the night, suddenly the door opened and there is screaming, get out, get out. And there were barbed wire with uh, floodlights and there was the barbed wire because electric tension and there were SS guys, uh, the guards with uh, leather jackets and German shepherds barking and uh, it was uh, a nightmare like you can but imagine and then they sorted us out the ones who were they felt they can still kill you through labor and who didn't look strong enough so they sent them straight to a gas chamber one of the prisoners who was pushing us out of the trains was a Czech guy and he told me say that you are healthy and uh, I didn't know what he meant but when we lined up in front of Dr. Mengele who with his finger to the right or to the left pointed <clears throat> I told him I'm healthy I said Gesund and whether that made it but the fact is that there were three boys two of my friends and me and I went one way and the other boys went, uh, went the other way and that I, at that point when I looked at the groups and we looked like the strong ones and they looked like the weak ones. I thought that I am going for hard labor and they go on, on um, light labor. So as it turned out, 
we were going to work and they were going to stay to a gas chamber. These are actual documents that you received after the war which tell you the fate of your family, correct Rachel? Right. So, yeah. so you actually learn when they went to Auschwitz. That's my mother. Uh, but there is no, there, it's very interesting, there is no cause of death. But if you go to the next one, if you go to the next one, it's for my brother. Mm -hmm. And there on the bottom, they were taken July 30th, 31st. And my brother adult died the 1st of October, 1942, at 9.30 p.m., cause of death. I can't see it, excuse me. No, right, go right Andro ahead. Uh, cause of death, enteritis with bodily weakness. You know what they did? They would open up a medical book, and wherever landed in the, open, in the medical book, they would just put it into on the cause of death. And they did that for my brother, and they did that for, for my two brothers, for, not for my mother, not for my sister, which means that when my mother and my sister arrived at Auschwitz, they were to what is called the spa, which was actually the gas chambers. And what they did when they walked into the camp, there was a sign that says, Arbeit macht frei, which means work makes you free. And they would tell them that they're going to be showered, and they would have an orchestra playing, and they would have an orchestra playing by the, by the gas chambers too, which they called the spa, and they would tell the people to get undressed and to fold their clothes very, very neatly and to tie their shoes together, because in those days, all shoes were, had to be tied, the laces, and they, to, put it under their, to put them under their seat. And then they would send them into the showers. And then they would throw in the gas, and that's how they died. So my mother and my, and my sister died as soon as they arrived in Auschwitz. My two brothers lived, uh, Adolf lived for three, two months, and Henri lived for six months. After the war, Rachel made it to America, got married and started a family, and became very involved in Holocaust education efforts. George emigrated to Canada, but without his sister Hannah, who died at Auschwitz. You can learn more about their story in our complete interview with George. Nearly 30 years later, on January 27, 1973, another event seeking to end war occurred as U.S. and North Vietnamese diplomats signed the Paris Peace Accords ending the Vietnam War. In the months that followed, prisoners of war were exchanged and American soldiers returned home. We end this episode with Vietnam veterans Jack Jackson and Michael Moore, who remind us of the difficulties that some soldiers faced as they returned home and share their perspectives of honoring veterans for their service. My brother was a, was a senior in high school. He was several years younger. He was playing basketball one night. And back then, I went to watch him. Been home about three weeks, maybe four. And when the game ended, instead of like in your gymnasium, your sports, they end with a horn. We're in this gymnasium. They ended it by firing a pistol that starts a track meet. And I wasn't watching. And when they fired that pistol, I literally dove under the bleachers. Everyone began to laugh and make fun. And they knew I was a Marine. I had a short haircut. My wife crawled off of that stage took my hand, and we walked out of that stage with our heads up. And as a legacy, my job is to make sure when you come home, you're never treated that way. Over the four years and the three tours I did, and, um, uh, it got to where we was not allowed to wear our uniforms ashore and stuff like that because of demonstrators and things. Uh, that's one reason why I got out of the active service. Honoring veterans, I, I believe, really should be uh, something that is preached in schools uh, because without the veterans, there's many rights we would not have. And that's what we were doing in Vietnam. And I, I still believe that's what we were there for, it, trying to keep people free. Uh, and that's the biggest thing a vet does for you. And uh, not to respect that is, I, I don't know, it's uh, one of the great sins in my book. <laughs>